This morning we are continuing our examination of Peter's introduction to his letter. So please turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to read chapter 1 verses 1 and 2 together. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. Now, this last week I told you that I wanted to frame this passage with a view to the who and the how, specifically how they are the who. And we discussed the authorship of the letter and its challenges. We affirmed the plain reading of the text and the historic testimony of the church. This letter was written by the Apostle Peter. I took some time to highlight some things about Peter and to draw his unique role in the church and the value of receiving a letter from him. And we looked at the region of these churches and their, their common union in Christ. Uh, we unpacked that these believers' identity as dispersed or scattered aliens and strangers and sojourners and highlighted that we too are in this company of aliens who are scattered, anticipating a homeland. And finally, while wrapping up the who of this introduction, the Apostle Peter and the dispersed believers, we address that there is a reason that they are who they are, that Peter is an apostle of Jesus Christ, and that these believers scattered throughout Asia Minor are strangers and aliens in their own homes. So now we come to the how. And it, um, it is that Peter and these dispersed believers have been chosen by the triune God. So the how is that Peter and these dispersed believers have been chosen by the triune God. But this now introduces one more who element. And I'd like to take some time to address this, uh, specifically the triune God, because while the doctrine of the Trinity is a robust and clear doctrine throughout the Old and New Testament scriptures, Peter is among the few passages that address all three persons in one concise passage together. And that's not to communicate that it's uh, an extremely rare occurrence, but that it's more often than uh, that one or two of the members of the Godhead are directly addressed at a given time. Uh, now I'd like to highlight a few other examples of the Trinity spoken of together, beginning with John chapter 3. In John chapter 3, in verse 34 to 36, you see the Father sent the Son, the Son provides eternal life, and the Son gives the Spirit without measure. In Romans 15, verses 15 and 16, you see a minister of Jesus the Son, the gospel of God the Father, returning offerings sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 9, 13 and 14, the Son offered himself through the Spirit without blemish to God the Father. Now, this last passage I'm going to read, I'm going to actually read it in full, not just the reference. And I see it as the closest parallel to how Peter also speaks of the Trinity in our text. So if you have a copy of the scriptures, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 14. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 14. The Apostle Paul states, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to, to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood and forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory." In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance, with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. So regarding the, uh, this passage in Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verses 3 to 14, and I apologize, I was a little delayed on the, the slides there if you were reading along in that regard. But regarding this passage, Paul ends, states, quote, 
In the eternal plan of God, it was decreed that the Father would plan the redemption through the election and predestination. The Son would provide redemption through his atoning death. The Holy Spirit would affect the plan through regenerating and sealing the believers. So again, you see that a clear unpacking of the, the triune God, the Trinity there, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and specifically how they are participating in the redemption, the salvation of the people. So it's not an exact parallel to what is expressed in Peter, but it is quite close. Again, 1 Peter 1, and, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, the very end of chapter, uh, verse 1, chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. So you have the Father. He foreknew and elected a people. You have the Spirit set apart, sanctifies the elect. And then you have the Son, redeemed the elect and calls them to obedience. Now, there's a common ordering to the persons of the Trinity, uh, not according to rank, but express identity and relationship and work. And regarding this, it's been stated uh, by uh, Dr. John MacArthur and Dr. Richard Mayhew in their combined systematic theology, the quote, these distinct modes of relationship regarding the Trinity establish a, a definite order within the Trinity so that it is, it is proper to say with respect to their relationships only, not with respect to their essence, glory, or majesty, that the Father is first, the Son is second, and the Spirit is third. However, there are times uh, when the three persons are referenced together um, that the order is, is changed for a various purposes. So it's not always Father, Son, and Spirit. Most notably in our passage here in 1 Peter chapter 1. And in our, uh, in our passage, Peter has placed the order as the Father, the Spirit, and the Son while communicating elements of salvation. Again, foreknowing and thereby electing by the Father, sanctifying and thereby continually making holy by the Spirit, and obedience directly rooted in the completed sacrificial work of the Son. Now, further, it should be noted that the members of the Trinity uh, are not isolated to a prescribed function or work. Um, we don't need to fall into that. There are clear and intimate overlaps of works that are primarily identified with one member or another. That is consistently true throughout the, the revelation we're providing the scriptures. However, there is occasionally overlap and interweaving of function and purpose and work within the Trinity. Uh, some examples is all members of the Trinity are at various times identified with creating and preserving the creation, the work of redemption, and the work of sanctification. So the doctrine of the Trinity is quite important, uh, important enough that it can, it can literally draw the line between orthodox and unorthodox doctrine. And therefore, as a church, we do affirm the triune God, and we can affirm it because of its clarity in passages such as the one before us today. And think about this. Peter is providing the introduction to not only the letter, but his larger treatment of the theme of salvation. And he lays this early foundation on the bedrock of the Trinity not just affirming our common salvation, but rooting it in the work of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I think that's worthy of our attention. Now, the Trinity can be, it can be a challenging doctrine to work through, and, and we gave it really cursory attention, but it's a plain element of Peter's introduction and uh, will frame really what follows. Also, again, the doctrine of the Trinity is a test of orthodoxy, so it's important to highlight these things. But, I want to, but what I want to highlight next, and, and more directly addressing the how element of 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, um, is another precious but challenging doctrine, but it's not a test of orthodoxy. Trinity, a, a test of orthodoxy. But this doctrine, while challenging um, to various extents, to various persons at various times in their understanding and even uh, progressive uh, working through the scriptures and maturing in that, um, it's still not a test of orthodoxy. We have friends who struggle and will struggle with Peter with what's directly addressed here, namely election unto salvation according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. It's plainly stated there. Um, names the churches, the believers who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. So, again, can be challenging for persons. And I have had various engagements and relationships with people that uh, this has been more and less challenging to them. And one such instance was on December 12th, 2019, I received the email that you see up on the screen. And I, I chose to put this on here because I want you to see 
a personal engagement. And I want you to see that I'm handling it respectfully. Um, I've redacted the name uh, for obvious reasons. So the email states, hi, David, this is redacted that you met at the Seniors Fellowship today. Just wanted to make sure you're aware of Grace Bible Church's stand on election. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, or toward or to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Yours in Christ, redacted. Now, earlier that day, um, an elder, I met an elderly gentleman who was a guest at a church's senior luncheon where I was speaking. Um, he heard of my transitioning to Grace Bible Church and was very encouraged and interested in knowing more about me and the, the church. So he took down my information and the church's information, and he apparently did some due diligence on my behalf. And after reading the doctrinal statement, he sent me the email that I just read. And truthfully, I'm not offended that this gentleman was concerned, but I am grieved that something that Peter finds as a source of joy, of encouragement and comfort, he found to be a point of caution. And to express that caution, he cited of all persons, Peter. Now, while I would encourage you to, to read our whole statement on salvation, I wanna highlight what I presume would be a principal point of concern for this gentleman and so many others. Uh, within the Grace Bible Church's doctrine of salvation, we have a section on election. And this is just a portion of that. Again, I would direct you to the full entire context but if I had to guess, this is likely what's catching attention. It states, quote, election. Election is the act of God by which, before the foundation of the world, he chose in Christ those whom he graciously regenerates, saves, and sanctifies. Now, note the provided support reference for this statement. Uh, there's various uh, support texts that are provided. Um, and I'd like for you specifically give special attention to the last one. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. So what this fundamentally comes down to is, what did God the Father know, and in what way did he know it? Well, Peter plainly uses the term foreknowledge, to have prior knowledge. But in what way? And that's really the key element. Nobody's disputing. Nobody's challenging the scriptures. I would say people on both sides very much love the scriptures. Um, but what does he mean by foreknowledge? Well, first we have to affirm God's perfect knowledge of all things or his omniscience, which is a, a larger umbrella for this doctrinal point. And omniscience is quite plain and clear. As we read, um, as we read in Psalm 139 verses 1 and 4, quote, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You have uh, you know when I sit down and when I rise. You understand my thoughts from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down. You're intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there's a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. Psalm 147, verses 4 and 5. He counts the numbers of the stars. He gives to, uh, names to all of them. Great is our Lord in abundant strength. His understanding is infinite. Proverbs 5.21, for the way of, ways of a man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he watches all his paths. Proverbs 15.3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, watching the evil and the good. 1 John 3.20, and whatever our heart condemns us, um, and whatever our heart condemns us, for God is greater than our heart and knows all things. So we all affirm God is omniscient. He knows all things. But why this prefix on knowledge? making it a specific expression of knowledge. For knowledge, knowing before. Well, God knowing things before is a lesser included element of God knowing all things perfectly or having divine omniscience. Now, while there's plainly an element of prior knowledge expressed here, there's an understanding of more than a cognitive affirmation. This is also an intimate knowledge or a setting of favor upon someone. And Again, it's more of an intimate knowledge or the setting of a favor upon someone. Here, God having set his favor upon a people who he chose um, who He chose for himself or elected from among all of the peoples to be his own redeemed people, to be the beneficiaries of the atoning work of the Son and the sanctifying work of the Spirit. And something helpful here is that God has always, always had a perfect and complete knowledge of, of all of the nations and all of the persons 
but the application of his foreknowledge is plainly applied to his redeemed people, communicating again that it's not simply prior knowledge, but overt setting of affection upon them. Again, he knows all peoples. He knows all nations. And yet when he applies his foreknowledge, it's to Israel. It's to the church. It's to a people that he's redeemed for himself. Again, God plainly knows all people. He perfectly knows all things, but he foreknows his redeemed. He knows them differently, not in regard to time and space, but relationally. And this can be seen with a, a contrast of whom Jesus says he has and has not known. John 10, 14, I am the good shepherd and I know my own and my own know me. And by contrast, the Lord who knows all things and all persons, Matthew 7, 23, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So the primary concern of God's foreknowing was not what he knew, but who he knew and in what capacity he knew them. So this is an important, uh, this is important relationally, but also by way of sovereign action too. So again, foreknowledge is very important to understand in regard to relational and in terms of sovereign action. So let's consider four examples of how foreknowing is more than a relational matter, but one of sovereign action too, uh, which would have been of extraordinary encouragement and comfort to Peter's readers. And I hope it will be to us too. Romans 8, 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that we would be the firstborn among many brethren. Romans eleven two. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know that the scriptures say in the passage about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? 1 Peter 1, 20, for he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you. So we see a consistent pattern here of foreknowledge intimately informing sovereign and relational action by God. Again, we see a consistent pattern here of foreknowledge intimately informing sovereign and relational action by God. Now, our fourth example is the only other usage of the noun form as Peter uses it in our text. And that's in Acts chapter 2, verse 23. And I want to immediately view this last reference in parallel with another passage from Acts 4. Acts 2, 23. This man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. Acts 4, 27 and 28. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. So do, do you see the connection uh, perhaps a little bit more plainly now? Foreknowledge is a prior knowledge, but it is a relational and affection setting knowledge, and it's also a knowledge that intimately impacts the sovereign outworking of God's plans. Now, let me give you a picture of this. For months, um, I was praying for baby Neil. Um, that, that's how I prayed for Noel, because I had a, a lack of foreknowledge regarding both gender and name. So it was just baby Neil. And I could only operate with the available information. But even if I did have knowledge ahead of time, uh, it was sourced outside myself, and it would have no impact on the information, origin, or outcome. So it wouldn't have any impact on the information's origin or outcome. By contrast, if one who is sovereign over all things, and in particular we say this with a view to the redemption of sinners through Christ, then his knowing is self-originating and intimately impacting, of, um, has intimate impact on the known object and action. Because for God to foreknow is to foreordain, as the one cannot exist without the other. So in this regard, with God, there are no potentialities. It's not that he knows every variable and possible outcome. He knows exactly how it will be, so there are no even potential variables, only realities. So to maybe improve upon Shakespeare, as the Lord foreknows, so shall it be. Again, so as the Lord foreknows, so shall it be. Again, I know the matter of God the Father, uh, Father's foreknowledge and choosing a people for himself. It is a very hard doctrine for many people. But this is but the beginning of Peter's establishing a big view of God, 
which is exactly what his readers needed. They didn't need a big view of man. They needed a big view of God where, um, because that's where you find endurance. That's where you find comfort. That's where you find hope, especially amidst struggle and suffering. Now, we took some time to address the Father's foreknowledge, and we'll look at the, the two remaining persons and work of the Trinity, as highlighted by Peter here. And we're not going to take quite as long on these, but they are important elements of Peter's introduction and of our appreciating salvation. So let's begin by the sanctifying work of the Spirit. By the sanctifying work of the Spirit. Peter goes on to address the work of the Spirit here, that it's one of setting the believer apart unto God, setting the believer apart unto God to separate us unto holiness. And the sanctifying work of the Spirit could um, express point in time of salvation or the progressive working out of salvation in the believer's life or possibly both. In any and all of these, the believer is being set apart unto God, being made holy, effectively putting God's election into personal action. So whether, again, it's a point in time salvation, it's the progressive working out of salvation, either way or both, it's putting God's election into personal action. That's the work of the Spirit. And Paul plainly um, expresses this also in 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 2.13. But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. Again, but we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. So how important... Um, how important this work of sanctification, being set apart, set aside is, I don't think it can be overstated. And there's an absolute necessity of being set apart in the sanctification and the holiness. As the author of Hebrews plainly states in chapter 12, verse 14, he states, quote, pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. Now, from the Father's electing, the Spirit's sanctifying to the Son and covenant obedience. One of the, the plainest expressions of having been foreknown and of being sanctified is obedience. And Peter will provide charges and commands for actions throughout his letter. And it is here a foundational element of the introduction and of expressing the work of the triune God in salvation, um, intimately tying obedience to the Son. John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. This is not ambiguous. It does not even require the unpacking of terms like we took the time to do with foreknowledge. Obedience is simply a submission and compliance with the revealed will of God. It's keeping his commandments. And Peter is, is, is tying that expectation of obedience, not only to one's relationship with the Trinity, but one's relationship with the Trinity in view of salvation. Further, the required obedience of the Son neither nullifies grace or salvation by faith alone, as plainly observed through Romans, where obedience is an informative theme within the book itself. Romans 1.5, you have the charge of the apostleship was to bring about the obedience of faith in others. Uh, Romans 6.16, you have slaves to obedience resulting in righteousness. Romans 15.18, the fruit of faithful labor produces obedience of believers in word and deed. Romans 16.19, the testimony that was rejoiced in was a testimony of obedience. And Romans 16, 26, knowing Christ leads to the obedience of faith. So expressing the connection of obedience with the Son is quite natural and should be wholly expected and embraced. But this next element tied to the Son, I think, was a little bit more challenging. Quote, to be sprinkled with his blood. To be sprinkled with his blood. Now, sprinkling with blood is a really a magnificent image that further articulates the work of the Son. Uh, blood sprinkling was part of the Old Testament sacrificial system of worship, but blood sprink uh, sprinkling on the, uh, on the corporate people of God, that was only applied at the inauguration of the Mosaic Covenant, Exodus chapter 24. You have verse 8 as a point of reference. There were, however, two other times that blood would be sprinkled on individuals. When Aaron and his sons were set apart as priests, uh, Exodus 29, 21 would serve as an example there. 
And when someone was confirmed um, healed or cleansed from a leprous disease, a skin problem, a skin condition, you have an example of Leviticus 14.7. Now, of this whole section, 1 Peter 1, um, verses 1 and 2, I've wrestled with this, this element, the sprinkling with his blood, more than anything. Uh, specifically, what point of reference does Peter appear to be making here? And I will immediately rule out the anointing of the priest. Um, there's simply no clear point of connection and it would be better suited to uh, more uh, of a more overt connection to perhaps chapter 2, where it talks about a royal priesthood. Um, but as I will argue there, it's not a reference or comparison to the Arianic priesthood, but a, a corporate charge to be a witness-bearing people. So it doesn't work, in my conclusion, with the priesthood connection. This leaves the inauguration of the Mosaic Covenant with Israel and the cleansing of the lepers as our options. And I've been persuaded of both and, and find really no special joy in appearing to, to vacillate on a position. But I'm not so proud that I would not uh, reinvestigate my conclusions and press myself to the best solution. So with this being stated, I want to rule out Leviticus 14, while also briefly acknowledging its reasonable merits. So this decision comes down to really three elements from the text. The first would be the, the order expressed. Um, secondly, the identity of individual or corporate. And third, the larger intent of what is being expressed. So that's part of how I worked out my decision between Leviticus and Exodus. Again, the order expressed and why, the identity, if it's an individual or if it's a corporate uh, body that's being referenced, and the larger intent of what's being expressed. Well, first, it's plain to most of us that Peter has reordered the, the normal pattern expected when addressing the Trinity from Father, Son, and Spirit to Father, Spirit, and Son. Well, the argument for the Levitical, uh, Leviticus connection here would see that this was because he was expressing justification, sanctification, and then obedience that is accompanied by a continued life of repentance. Uh, the clearest parallel being David's like use of Leviticus 14 when he expresses his intense prayer of repentance in Psalm 51 and states, quote, purify me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. It's a referencing to that sprinkling and cleansing. They would sprinkle, cleanse, and declare them clean. Well, this also obviously has the um, expression of a life of ongoing personal repentance while pursuing obedience. So that would be, again, a reasonable conclusion tied to the Leviticus side. So while a bit oversimplified, um, I think it's a reasonable expression of how I personally worked through the conclusion before. Um, again, that element of obedience, that element of continual repentance. These are reasonable things that would be a, a point of connection, point of reference. Again, as Psalm 51, I believe, plainly made with this text. So while a bit um, simplified, again, I think it's a fair representation for our purposes now. Um, there are more complete treatments of this position, but I believe, again, this will be sufficient. Now, I'll give a little bit more attention to the Exodus 24 connection and its ramifications, but first I'll address those three elements of the decision for its conclusion as well, so that the order expressed. And that is challenging, but I think it's addressed best by considering the larger intent. So I'm actually going to skip from one thing to the next, because I think larger intent expresses why in the order. So I would understand it being a sequential order, um, the Father foreknew and elected a people. The Spirit set apart, sanctifies the elect. The Son redeemed the elect and calls them to obedience. So again, you have election, sanctifies, and the elect are called to obedience. So the matter of contextual audience, was it to an individual or was it corporate? I think that's a little bit more straightforward. And while we don't need to... Um, uh, while we don't experience a, a corporate salvation, we are a corporate body that was redeemed in Christ. And Peter addresses uh, is addressing bodies of believers. Here, I think that's consistently, he uses the plural. And I see a corporate emphasis more plainly than an individual emphasis. And finally, the matter of uh, larger intent. I see it as establishing an introduction, both of the letter and of his forthcoming unpacking of our glorious salvation in Christ, um, here established as a work of the triune God. So really that was one of the biggest deciding factors was that it's not just an expression of um, general obedience and repentance, but that um, larger connection to our salvation that he's going to go on to unpack 
and specifically how the Triune God has um, participated and uh, caused this to come about. Further, uh, this use of sprinkled blood is used um, only one other time in the New Testament, Hebrews 12, 18 to 24, where it's making direct reference to the instituting of the Mosaic Covenant and then highlighting the superiority of the New Covenant through Christ's blood. So that's not a determinative factor, but I do think that's an, a point of insight that I would have to factor in and help persuade me. Now, um, again, that's Hebrews 12, 18 to 24. I'd, I'd leave it uh, for you to read. I do have it, I believe, up on the screen, but um, for time's sake, I'm going to continue on. It's directly pointing back to Exodus 24. So again, I believe that Peter's making that exact same connection here in 1 Peter 1. And we can see that by looking at the inst uh, this instance in which the blood was sprinkled at the instituting of the Mosaic Covenant in Exodus 24, uh, verses 1 to 8, I think it makes it a little bit more plain. So let's look at that together, Exodus 24, verses 1 to 8. This is 24, 1 to 8. Make sure I have it up on the screen for you there. Then he said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nabad, and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and you shall worship at a distance. Moses alone, however, shall come near to the Lord. But they shall not come near, nor shall the people come up with him. Then Moses came and recounted to the people all the words of the Lord and all the ordinances. And the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has spoken we will do. Again, the first point of reference in which they are hearing the covenant that has just been established and is being established. And they're affirming we will obey that which has been stated. Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. Then he arose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain with twelve pillars for the twelve tribes of Israel. He sent young men of the sons of Israel, and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as peace offerings to the Lord. Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and the other half of the blood he sprinkled in the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they all said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do, and we will be obedient." So Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with, with you in accordance with all of these words. So here we have the instituting of the Mosaic covenant. The people are hearing the uh, prescribed elements of the covenant, the expectations, and they are as a corporate body affirming, We will obey. We have heard and we will obey. So the connection here is even more direct, I think, to Peter's statement, which knits obedience to the sprinkled blood. Under the Mosaic Covenant, there was the, the necessary shedding of blood with the cutting of the covenant. And as the nation entered into that covenant and were sprinkled with blood, again, you've heard they affirmed their obedience to the covenant, an obedience that ultimately they could not keep. And Peter affirms this so clearly when speaking at the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15, where he states, now, therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing upon, the, uh, placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? Now, Christ has shed his own blood in the instituting of a better covenant, providing redemption and the means as well as the expectation to obey with transformed hearts. We submit in faith and repentance and affirm what we, by God's power, can now obey. Imperfectly, but it's still obedience that bears the testimony of Christ's redemption and lordship over his redeemed. So with this Trinitarian reference, Peter unpacks God's election and demonstrates that it's the work of God that brings these things to completion. There is a point in time conversion in which we participate, but it was according to the foreknowledge or eternal decree of God. There is a setting apart to holiness that we are certainly required to participate in, but this is a work of the Spirit of God, and there is a life of obedience, daily thoughts and actions that are to be pleasing to God. But this too is by means of the sacrificial work of the Son. It is His righteousness that is rendered to our account. So, today we finished with this laying uh, Peter's introductory foundation for both the letter and the thematic element of salvation. 
And I think that it would be helpful to see that a critical element to this foundation is Peter's highlighting the work of the triune God. Again, Peter's highlighting the work of the triune God. And as we saw today, the foreknowledge of God the Father, a foreknowledge that was relational and sovereignly impactful, a most necessary element of answering how, how these persons are strangers and aliens. And this continued to be impacted with the sanctifying work of the Spirit and the expectation of obedience to the Son, an obedience that can be applied and is expected. At the base of Mount Sinai, the people affirmed an obedience that they could not keep. But we've been called to an obedience which, by God's grace, we can keep. So here, Peter's provided a thesis-like expression of what he will go on to, to further unpack as he shows us that our salvation, our election, informs our identity, our sanctification, which in terms informs our conduct or obedience. Again, do you hear that Trinitarian formula that he's um, established in verses 1 and 2 impacting how he continues to address the remainder of the book? And again, if you do submit in this way, if, if you have enjoyed God's salvation, his election, which informs your identity, your sanctification, which in terms informs your conduct, your obedience, this will inevitably introduce us to suffering. But because of the source of our salvation, the source of our identity, and the cause of our conduct, we rejoice in glory. And so again, just as we've established in our general introduction, I think it's rooted in this uh, articulation of the work of the Trinity in terms of our salvation. So salvation, identity, conduct, suffering, and glory. Finally, the letter's formal introduction concludes with a familiar salutation of, of grace and peace. And these two words uh, are a magnificent expressions of the love and glory of God applied toward his church, church. So while peace, or shalom, was and continues to be a common expression of greeting and departure among the Jewish people, it has, been, it has here been coupled with the church's rich understanding that they, we, have experienced the greatest peace through God's grace in Christ. So these two words, grace and peace, were frequently paired throughout the New Testament epistles and, and were foundational reminders that would set the tone of the letters. They weren't just a, a, formula, a formulaic way to greet. They were intentionally speaking truth and establishing the foundation of truth. So Peter here frames these words a little uniquely too. He doesn't just say grace and peace. He, inf uh, he expresses them in the form of a blessing for these beloved churches. So, may grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you. We thank you for your word that you provided for us. We thank you that we know you because you've chosen to reveal yourself to us through your scriptures. And part of that revelation is that you are a, a, a trinity, a triune God. One God, three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, working in perfect concert with one another to redeem a people for himself, to accomplish all your purposes. And what an encouragement, what an encouragement that would have been to these churches that suffering's on the horizon, the, the struggles of, of common and daily faithfulness already is pressing enough. We are aware of our enemies, the world, the flesh, and, our, and the devil himself. And so what an encouragement to, to understand that who we are is rooted in the work of the triune God, affecting our salvation and accomplishing your work. And when we come to the conclusion, when we affirm the covenant that you've established, we can say that, yes, we will obey because you've transformed our hearts, because you've done your effectual work and because you continue to work in our hearts. And so we rejoice in you, O Lord, and we pray that you would be exalted and honored and being our help and joy and the object of our worship, um, be it through a life of faithfulness, be it through suffering or whatever else you choose to provide for us, we have a salvation that is rooted in the work of the Trinity of our, of our God the Father, God the Spirit, and God the Son. And so to this, we give thanks to you, and we pray that you find us faithful. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.